and we are on air all right welcome 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 what's up everyone sorry that we took a moment or two to get this video up and running it should be going live now we've got we've got a minute or two delay it's pretty short now at this point so if there's questions or come or if you have questions or if you want to talk with us uh, in the chat box below you can do that leave notes in there we'll be monitoring that uh, throughout this I know we've got Daniel in here uh, a handful of other people here as we get started Dane how are you doing man I am awesome how are you where are you at yes. right now I'm in a hotel you're in a hotel in what city mm -hmm. you know I don't even have a lease to a house or a house or a place to stay right now <laughs> going from hotel to hotel well no I go to I'm actually you know what I'm living in my parents basement <laughs> at home for reals yeah I don't have to pay rent it's great works times have been times have been pretty tough <sighs> nice I, I think I'm actually energetically tapped into the field of a broke musician even though I actually have an income and stuff so like you know it's kind of it's kind of wild like I kind of want to downgrade my car or like Already in my parents' basement, etc. But yeah, I'm doing incredible. So thanks. Filming so out of a van that could be fun. I wonder if it gets you into this space more. Well, we can talk about that, and we can talk a lot, a lot more stuff tonight. So for those of you listening, as we talked about, it's the first night of the summit. This is going to be our after party. So um, if you've been listening to a bunch of videos today, this is going to be way more relaxed, way more chill, way more um, interactive, and just fun. Um, and we're going to be talking about teaching monks how to make money from a monastery. Uh, so all of that's going to be happening. Um, hmm. By way of more relaxed, Andy, did you just mean that you're going to be lazier? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> well, the thing is I've had to be on for so many of these interviews. It's, it's, I was talking with, uh, was I talking to somebody about the interviews just recently, uh, Chandler about how it's way more energy and work to be doing the interviews than getting interviewed. Getting interviewed, you just kind of like hang out, you get a chat, tell stories, it's fun. Doing the interviews, it's like, man, you have to be paying attention and knowing what the next thing's going to be and just like, it, it takes way more energy for me anyway. So mm. I don't have to do all that here. You've been doing a great job, man. I appreciate everything you're doing. Thanks, dude. So let's, let's first talk about the monastery. Why are we at a monastery? Right. So can we get a little context set context for the hour is we're going to be talking about making money as a skill and, and talking about it in relation to how anybody can learn the skill. And that's what we're going to spend the hour doing. So if by the end of the hour, uh, I hope that everyone that's listening has a exciting, excited perspective on the real good that money can be. In your life um, and so I went to a monastery for a month and it was pretty cool it was hard hard's an understatement uh, it's brutal actually Let me take a breath after I say that mm. and I went there because I've been spending a year with this mentor of mine and he's completely changed my life and I've worked with him nearly nearly every day for a year um, probably on average four times a week. But over the course of a year, that's a lot of time to spend. Well, eventually this guy tells me that his meditation teacher is at this place in Vermont. And I was like, wait, I could learn from your meditation teacher and I've been learning from you stuff? Yeah, I want to go there, right? So if you remember at the very beginning of the, if, you, if you're joining now at the very first interview, I talked about how well I got really good at getting great a, straight A's in college because I made friends with all of them, all my professors. I got really good at online competitive computer gaming when I was in high school and I had no friends because I went to the best players and I learned from them in, in computer games. Um, and then when I went to learn in business, I went and found the best people and I learned from them. And so here, you know, I, I'm just kind of like naturally do it now because I just know it works. And I really like doing things that work. So I found out this guy's meditation teacher. I wanted to go spend a month there. There's a lot more to it than that uh the 30 second more lot to it is that i had a pretty traumatic upbringing i grew up in a very uh, suburban area but um for whatever reason my parents didn't really know how to guide my heart while in public school 
So what happened is I had been lost and disoriented as my worldview while I was bullied, while I was attacked, while I was rejected consistently, you know, throughout the days by teachers, by students, and my parents aren't really there to protect me or tell me what's happening. So by having a worldview of feeling lost and then being consistently treated and abused as feeling worthless, I had to come to some harsh decisions about myself. I had to come to some harsh decisions about what I thought reality was, and I had to come to some harsh decisions that, that are along the lines of I had, to, I had to end up convincing myself that love isn't real and love doesn't exist just in order to survive. Well, that's been a hard thing to rewire. So the thought was that I could go to the monastery for a month and really sit in the beauty of where my life is now and let my body update to how great my life is. So that was really why I went is to sit and let my whole nervous system upgrade to how awesome my life is. While I was there, they invited me to the one of their meetings. And it was so, so bizarre and awkward to watch the monks talk about their financial situation. How did it, come it was, up? Well, it's part of the meeting. They had, they had their meeting and you know, they're like, all right, so guys, now we're going to talk about our product. And they have something called modmind.org. It's like a mindfulness program that they sell to schools to help kids with mindfulness as part of their nonprofit initiative. And they're also selling it to teachers who want to teach mindfulness now. And it looks like a cool platform, but it's so funny. They're like, all right, guys, modmind, how many sales do we have? And like, this guy raises his hand, he's like, uh, zero. <laughs> They go, oh, zero mind mind sales. It's like, all right, well, or do we have like a half a point? No, it's pretty much zero. Okay. <laughs> it's funny. I'm looking at it, and the website looks beautiful. The website looks beautiful. Well, you know, yeah, you know, this is a great product. I bet they're killing it. Yeah. Well, they fooled you. They're doing all right, but it's 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 in a, it's in a number of schools. But you know, what's actually freaking hilarious is one of the head monks there actually took the foundation <laughs> he took the foundation he, he he couldn't afford to continue so he dropped out after like the second or third month or whatever mm -hmm. but he's like he actually used everything he learned in the foundation to like create the website you're looking at and like to innovate innovate to innovate the monastery so he's using the skills they learned in the foundation to like onboard monks and it's pretty cool mm -hmm. um, now anyway that's just random. Like there's like 16 monks in that monastery. One of them happened to take the foundation. <laughs> so we sit there, they have zero sales. And then they come to me, they say, so Dane, you, do you have, do you have any like uh, suggestions or, you know, they, they, the, the head monk, his name is Soryu. He's like, so Dane, do you, do you have any experience with sales? And I was so excited when he said this. I'm like, Oh yeah, yeah, sure. I do. <laughs> he's like, he's like, really? Like, have you ever done sales on the phone? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, like a ball. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I've, I've got this. I've tied my shoes a few times. So they asked them, can you share any wisdom on like how you might sell this product? And I was like, well, first thing I would do is I would flip the whole funnel. So people are upset with you if you can't pay them, right? You want to start thinking about this whole thing where you're flipping the funnel on them, where you're positioning everything in such a way where the person is upset if they can't actually pay you and they're like kind of scratching their head. Like, well, how, how do you do that? Long story short, we ended up talking about how to, how to position things so people would be upset if your product didn't exist. It's a really, really great skill to have. The, uh, it, it ended up morphing into me. The thing that I, more important than, Andy, than that, Andy, was how, how much I, how much suffering I felt to see the monks struggling with money. That was what was kind of heartbreaking. I, I watched, you know, the 15 monks that sit around the room, like they're wicked committed to mindfulness and wicked committed to meditation. But, you know, the art of money, they just, they fall impotent. And so I was really, really uh, saddened by that. It made me feel really sad. And so I offered to teach, two classes and this is separate from you know the meeting where they asked me for advice on how to sell stuff i set up two classes and in the two classes i taught them as much as i could about how to make money and so in the classes what we did is we copied 
the Wall Street Journal sales letter. And then immediately after copying it, they made their own sales letter selling monks how to come to the monastery. So for those that are listening, you know, the Wall Street Journal is a very famous publication. Well, they have one of the greatest sales letters of all time. So if you I'm go gonna, and... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to research it and I'm going to read it out loud so people know this. Yeah, yeah. You could probably just read like the first paragraph or two. Yeah. Well, you know what's funny is that no, well, it's it's fast. I'm gonna read it, and this gets used over and over and over. Jeff Walker, for whatever reason, I watched one of his videos for his launch. Uh, he's been launching Product Launch Formula for like a decade now. The opening story that he used in his last launch was this story, over and over. This framework. This framework. Dear reader, on a beautiful spring, late spring afternoon, 25 years ago, two young men graduated from the same college. They were very much alike. These two young men. Both had been better than average students. Both were personable, and both, as young college graduates are, were filled with ambitious dreams for the future. Recently, these two men returned to college for their 25th reunion. They were still, they were still very much alike. Both were happily married. Both had three children, and both, it turned out, had gone to work for the same Midwestern manufacturing company after graduation, and, we'll sh and were still there. But there was a difference. One of the men was a manager of a small department of that company, and the other one was its president. What made the difference? Have you ever wondered, as I have, what makes this kind of difference in people's lives? It isn't always a native intelligence or talent or dedication. It isn't that one person wants success and the other doesn't. The difference lies in what each person knows and how or she makes use of that knowledge. And that is why I'm writing to you and to people like you about the Wall Street Journal. For that is the whole purpose of the journal, to give its readers knowledge, knowledge that they can use in business. Boom. So what happened with this is... It's pretty profound. You know, they copied this letter and they learned how to ask for money. They learned how to position a product. They learned the art of storytelling. They learned, well, I think that's, those are good, the good things they learned. And but that backing up actually a, a second more, see, I've gotten so good at making money and good is in terms of a skill is that a lot of it is unconscious now. So I'm letting a lot of the unconscious kind of emerge to my conscious, which becomes words that I can then articulate. So what happens is, like with monks, I'm like, all right, these guys don't want to be businessmen. They just want to make a ton of money. And so I was like, all right, guys, would you like to know how to make a ton of money? And they're like, <laughs> you know, for good reasons. You know, I don't think I said make a ton of money, but like, you know, like I said, 100 grand a month or something, which is, you know, a lot of money. Uh, and what'd they say? Um, oh, they're very interested. They're very interested. They're so stressed every month, you know. Shouldn't you know they be that? renouncing all of their worldly desires? <laughs> I worked with them on that one. <laughs> yes, they would love to, but the fact is they need money to operate their location, right? So I so said, you, you can either dread this world and resist it for the rest of your life, or you can just master it, you know. And, and I think, I think the way of like one of my, like my big, big, my most important mentor, he says, you know, the way is evolving, you know, and I think meditation and mindfulness and monasteries in my world needs to evolve to, so that you could live in all the worlds. You can live in the physical world. You can live in the sexual world. You can live in the financial world. You can live in the spiritual world. You can live in all of them. You don't have to renounce any of them. But I don't think, I don't know about what this monastery is doing, but they're very much living and wanting to live in the financial world now. It was really funny to have the head monk guy be like, you put an interesting predicament, Dane. We now really have no choice but to make money. Because <laughs> like we, we, like, it's like really fascinating. I don't know if he said it exactly like that, but he's like, it was really fascinating to watch him like, oh crap, we kind of have to do this now if, if I remember it correctly. And and well, what I said is like, look, so you guys want to make money. You just need to master one skill. There is a skill for printing money. There is one skill and I can say the skill to you and it's concrete. It's not, it's not hocus pocus. It's very, very specific. If you want to make money and you don't want to own a business, you just want to make a lot of money and you want to make it at will and you want to print as much of it as you want. Learn the skill of customer acquisition. That's the one skill you need to learn. And if you learn customer acquisition, then you can print money. And they're like, what is that? It's like the art of getting customers, the skill of getting customers, the science of getting customers. If you only learn that, 
then you could go out and serve businesses that are struggling that you believe in and help them get customers. And they were really on board with this. They're like, whoa, this guy just condensed making money down into one thing, customer acquisition. So in order to learn customer acquisition, excuse my phone there. Um, so in order to learn customer acquisition, um, I wanted to show them the, the Wall Street Journal sales letter first. Right? How do you position a story? How do you do all this? So they copied the sales letter. Then, then they, they wrote a sales letter for how like monks could join the monastery. You know, so that the stories are great. They're like on a beautiful spring afternoon, two spiritual seekers um, were like were like just kind of walking about their day. Both of them had the same intellect. Both were about the same age. Both of them had the same desires for enlightenment. Fast forward 25 years, one is now enlightened and the other is still seeking what made the difference. <laughs> you know, mindfulness. <laughs> Come learn mindfulness at our monastery. And it was, they were really great letters, you know, and it was so exciting to walk. Like they were, I got to tell you, like if monks got into business, you should be terrified. <laughs> you should be freaking terrified like if, if monks if i was in competition with monks i wouldn't go into the industry because they're so freaking present and mindful looks there he created a, a a script because oh another thing i did is i helped them with a marketing video that they were sending to an investor i helped them just i just you know i'm just there serving you know I'm meditating and serving and the guy puts together he goes to work for a day and he comes back and he delivers this entire document it's like did you do all this yesterday in one day he's like yeah and I was like, oh my gosh, mindfulness is the sexiest thing I've ever seen in my life. Like I saw the results of mindfulness. It's like, you guys have no idea. This is freaking nuts. It was nuts. So anyway, it was so badass because I, excuse my language, I, I'll watch that as best I can. I gave them the sales letter and then they had them copy it. They were just boom, there, like present mindful copying the sales letter. And, and I, I, if, if, you know, I, I hesitate to go to black and white thinking. But I will this time, and I do other times, generally speaking. <laughs> See how I did what I did there? And, and, but I think I've discovered the secret to life, or no, sorry, the secret to enjoyable, an enjoyable life is to not add thoughts to anything that you're doing. Don't add thoughts. If you need a problem solve, go ahead and think. But if you don't add thoughts, like, you know, here I've got the guitar. And if I'm playing a scale and I'm like, da, da, oh, and I just screwed up, I could have a thought. Oh, no, I screwed up. Oh, no, this is like, nope, no thoughts. I just keep going until I get it. But if I had thoughts, like, oh, I'm so bad at this. But the same thing goes in business. So these guys have no thoughts. They're fully present. They're copying the letter. They get it done pronto. They, they, they rewrite the next letter. Then, then that was like two hours. Then the next day is where things got really exciting. Because the next day they came down, I sat down. I was like, all right, guys, who would like to see me cold call? And they're like, oh, you love that. yeah, I'd like to see that. I was like, all right, I'm going to call someone. I'm going to put my phone on speaker, and you guys are going to listen to me. And you guys are going to see how easy, how awesome, how fun, how exciting all this is. Are you guys ready? Like, ready. I'm like, all right. Okay, I feel my heart pounding. All right, who should I call? All right, let's call a bicycle. Well, it's 7 p.m. on the East Coast. I'll call someone in California. It's 4 o'clock over there. Yeah, so let's, let's look up some bicycle shops. Bicycle shops. We should be able to sell bicycle shops something. So I find a bicycle shop, and I call them. And I was like, you know what? I changed my mind. I want to do a doggy daycare. And so I look up a doggy daycare, and I, I call up a doggy daycare. And I was like, all right, just so you guys know, I have generally no idea what I'm going to say except for my intention is to serve and connect and try to sell them some solution to get them more customers that I'll go then try to figure out how to solve later. So the phone starts ringing, and let me pause for a second and back up. Uh, one thing I did before we did all this is I went around the table and I had all the monks there say, what's the first word that pops up when you think of money? Right? And it was heartbreaking. Evil, bad. Uh, tool for a tool, you know, just, just, just negative things. Generally speaking about money is like, do you guys want to hear what my worldview is of money? I'll close my eyes and do it. I'm like, sure. I sit down, I close my eyes and money, beautiful, elegant, a gift, a tool for good in the right hands. Boom, 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 et cetera. And I opened my eyes and they were all like, whoa, oh my gosh. And that really switched something for them. 
right? I was just that. Sharon Lee. Sharon Lee was just asking, have you seen the monks react adversely to learning about money? Of course, of course. You know, I see just about every human that I know, just about every freaking human I know react adversely about money. It's kind of weird that you know the richest people in the world seem to be somewhat dysfunctional. Not all of them, but it's just it's weird that. The guys that are making lots of money, they, they're pretty dysfunctional people usually. <laughs> it's not yeah, a hard and fast strange. rule. Yeah, it's strange. It's kind of well, like scary to think about. It's very scary and it's, it's, it's frightening. And, and it, it should be encouraging for anybody listening because you don't see if these people are dysfunctional and you're a healthy human being, then you have a very, very good advantage over them because it's just a skill. And if you just started Googling how to acquire customers, direct response marketing, the skill of customer acquisition, getting learning how to get customers, and you just started reading this stuff and that was your only focus and you were learning that skill, you'd set up you, you'd set up your family, you'd set up legacies, you'd set up generations, you'd set up your entire life to whatever degree. You now have a lever and if you want to make more money, you just push the lever. You want to make more money, you push the lever. You want to make more money, you push the lever. I kept pushing the lever until I got up to the tens of thousands of month income for myself and then I kind of got bored. So, so, so Andrew, Andrew asks, did you always feel this way about money? If not, how did you make the switch? Okay. Well, initially I was motivated because I thought that the amount of money I made had to do with my intelligence as a man. So I wanted to make a lot. Um, I thought that if I wasn't making a hundred grand a month that I would be a worthless man. And I thought that if any other man any other man had to go and get a job that he was a coward because he couldn't figure out how to create value on his own. He'd have to go crawl with his tail between his legs and hold his hand out for a paycheck and be like, please provide for me because I didn't know how to provide for myself. That's how strongly and negatively I, I viewed money. Now that I'm, a little more experienced I see that entrepreneurship isn't for everyone and the way that you find that out is by trying not by thinking about it and not by reading but by just trying it so how do you make the switch well this the, from well that that was the switch that was the initial motivator was I'm not intelligent unless I make a lot of money and so that was my worldview it created a lot of pain, actually, because when I first launched the foundation uh, with you, Andy, four or five years ago, you know, I saw our video on Facebook when my hair was a little bit thicker, my face is a little bit younger, and uh, and your head was shaved or buzzed, and I uh, I remember starting out there, and I still thought that the amount of money I made had to do with my intelligence. So it's a little hard for my heart. Uh, to see it, 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 the foundation was a very troubled business for me <clears throat> to run because I thought that the amount of money you made had to do with your intelligence. So I think I strong armed a lot of people into the foundation that shouldn't have been in the foundation uh, because I was so adamant that everyone become an entrepreneur. Um, and uh, or or I wasn't adamant about it, but I made the language seem like anybody could do it. And it's 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 not really for everyone, but there's no other way I know than to find out than just to try it for yourself. And and uh, I it's it's a, it's a really really yeah. It's a life changing. It's a life changing choice to try entrepreneurship, and I, I think that everyone should try entrepreneurship. I think everyone should try it for at least six months, because uh, you really want to commit to it. If you give up within a month, you don't give your mind the time to acclimate to it. And if you try entrepreneurship for six months and you decide, you know, your heart is really to be an employee, then that's a beautiful position for you, because if you have a particular craft, like if you're not passionate about the skills of what entrepreneurship are and you're passionate about a very specific, like if you're passionate about database management, if you're passionate about being a chef, if you're passionate about a really specific topic, then, you know, going to entrepreneurship could be a pretty miserable experience for you. 
But if you're passionate about having full control over your life and full freedom and all these things, more than a particular interest, then I think, you know, you probably want to dip your, your toe in. So answering this question, I have, I, it, was, it was a spectrum. It went from, I thought it reflected on my intelligence. So I made a lot of it and I was angry about it and it hurt my, and it hurt my heart uh, to, um, to like, wow, you know what? Money has nothing to do with my value. It's a simple skill. You know, making money is a skill. It's not like, wow, I'm suddenly like, there's, there's this like weird screwed up thing that people have done with money to make it seem like it's magical to make. Like, it's like, oh, how'd that guy do that? Mark Zuckerberg, $2 billion, this and that. Like when Yahoo offered for $2 billion, like there's this like magical aura around money. And I wanted to demystify that for people. And that's why I created the foundation was, was so that people wouldn't struggle with money. And it's, it's, it's very apparent that that's, that's my heart behind the foundation. You know, I bring my, brought my issues, brought my pride, brought my wounds with me at the time. But my heart is really just that people don't struggle with money. And so when I was at the monastery, I couldn't help but interrupt, <clears throat> interrupt my, <clears throat> excuse me, interrupt what I was doing there to serve them. So I cold called, right? And I was calling the, um, and actually, you know, I want to talk about the cold call in a second, Andy, but do you feel like I answered the question? Would you like to answer the question for yourself? I feel like you might have something to say that could reach a few more people than what I said. Yeah, I think you covered it. I think, um, I think key things, things that stood out when you talked about any, everyone should try entrepreneurship. It's for, it's not for everyone. I agree. I think, I think like, how you can know if it's for you or not is if there's a little voice in the back of your head that you won't be happy until you have something like until you have that level of freedom that you want or, or it, that was what it was for me. Um, I wanted the freedom to do what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it. Um, and, and that was the driving force behind, behind all of it. Uh, and I think if that's there and you listen to it and you follow it, um, then it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when for people. I want to say also, um, Nick, I, I like to answer the next question. Like I was going to talk about the cold calls. We have about a half hour, right? Yeah. So um, I was so blinded by this belief that the amount of money I made was a reflection of my intelligence that I foregone my passion for music that I foregone my passion for, I don't even say that word right, that I, 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 I foregoved, <laughs> whatever. Like I, I put it aside, my passion for public speaking. I put aside my passion for playing music because I read something that the rich don't exchange time for money. And, you know, I think there is also something in there about like, you know, unless they are learning, you know, unless they're passionate about it. So I dropped everything in my life where I could possibly be exchanging time for money. And I said that I'm only going to work on things where the more successful I become, the more free I become. You know, it's funny. So some of the wealthiest people do exchange time for money, which is what's made them wealthy. I remember being with Dan Sullivan and he says the wealthiest people in the world, if you study the wealthiest people, they're generally performers musicians, <laughs> sports players, uh, across the board. You, and it's, they're so good at that one thing and they've just got so good at that over and over and over. Um, I wish I could have read that somewhere. Right. I was 21. My, my poor mind was like just grappling onto any, we got to remember that I grew up with my primary worldview feeling lost and disoriented. I don't know if you know what it feels like to feel lost. If you're imagining the woods at night, the sun is setting and you might die if you don't find your way home. And every step you take in the woods, you feel more lost. That was my worldview for the first 20 plus years of my life. So when I find a book telling you what to do, I just latched onto that thing like crazy. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So, yeah. So yeah. Pad Tech asks, is the spectrum binary? Can you be an employee while still pursuing the entrepreneurial path? Of course. Totally. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, the question, um, the question is like, asking. Yeah. Sorry. Me first. <laughs> I, I think I think it's a great way to go about it. 
I think there's stuff to be learned when working for other people. Um, I think that was the path I had to go down. Like when was in debt with college, had to make money somehow, like I had to do something and just learning along the way. I think, I think if you're in that position, the key is to choose jobs where you can maximize your learning while you're making money and, and doing stuff on the side. Yep. Yeah. It's actually the best way to start as an entrepreneur is as an employee best subjective because you have a guaranteed income while you're starting. So you're not in survival mode. So you can make better decisions about your business. And totally. And, and you get a, you get to learn all of the stuff that people do so terribly wrong. Like I think, I think my, my experience in corporate America was so useful for me. Like I got to see how, how big companies make purchasing decisions where, you know, spending a quarter of a million dollars was nothing to them. I, I found our, I, I tell you this, I found our, Google, when I was studying like pay-per-click and stuff, I found our pay-per-click accounts for principal. Um, principal is a fortune 250 company. Uh, and I found our pay-per-click accounts. This is when I was first getting into direct response marketing. And I went in and I started looking and analyzing like all the stuff that we were buying traffic on. And uh, principal was buying, they were spending a hundred grand or so on keywords like life insurance and di directing them to principal.com, which is a site that has about 150 links where you can like click here to log in or access your account or read this article or get customer service here. 100 grand and our, our uh, ad agency, when you ask about it, why are you spending the money on this? They, they chalk it up to it's, it's helping brand awareness. That's their excuse for it or that's their reasoning behind it all. And you see stuff like that and you see what mm. it's like to live in, in that and, and when, you know, for me, that was the, the biggest fear I could have was imagining that life 20 years later. Like imagining that life 20 years later where I had to go into the office, I had to get dressed up, I had to have somebody else tell me what to do. It was fucking terrifying. Um, and that terror is a really good motivator. Yeah, so I like that. I, I have the question. I like the, like the story, especially the 20 years thing. Uh, there's a small echo. Um, so if you turn your headphones down um, or mute yourself, yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm sensing kind of the energy of the call, the first question about the monks, and then is it possible to be an employee entrepreneur? I'd like to really meet people where they are so we can guide them to where they want to go. Um, so I'll talk about the cold calls, the very important shifts of the cold calls for the next 10 minutes, and we can spend the last 15 on Q&A. Uh, so I cold called a doggy daycare and um, as soon as they picked up I just went on and said hey I just wanted to call you to let you know that I think cats are better than dogs <laughs> no I didn't actually say that that I think cats are better than dogs but I've actually thought about calling a doggy daycare just to say that and then I try to sell them something just to see uh, if I can do it um, and but what happened is I called him and I said hey uh, can I speak to your manager you know, and they're like, oh, yeah, the, man, the manager's not around, uh, but you could talk to me. Oh, great. Um, so thanks. I, I have a quick question for you. I'm just doing some research on doggy daycares, and I'm uh, thinking about getting into entrepreneurship to start something. And so I thought maybe I might offer something to doggy daycares. But the thing is, I don't really have anything to sell. I was wondering if there's anything in the realm, or I was wondering if, you're currently looking for any more dogs. Like if you have room for more dogs, cause I might be able to help send more dogs to you. Oh no, we're, 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 we're full right now. He's like, Oh, cool. Is that common for the dogs daycares to be full? And, she, and she's like, well, it's actually seasonal. You know, actually, you know, when it comes to January, we're going to be pretty empty again. <laughs> like, oh, well, that's a big open door. And I was like, so I was thinking about maybe we could try to use Facebook to maybe send you guys some more dogs, but it sounds like you guys might not be in need of that till January. Does that sound right? They're like, yeah, yeah. And I was like, well, uh, would you guys, have you guys ever tried Facebook? Does it, do you know if it works or not? Have you, is, does it sound interesting to you? And they're, well, you know, yeah, kind of, but I'm not the person to make decisions. Let me connect you with like my boss or whatever. So they just gave me like my boss's email or the boss's email. And then as what I said, very importantly, I just said, 
So I wonder if you could help me out. What's, what's the best way to sell your boss? You know him better than I do. <laughs> you know, and I can't remember. They said some couple things about like, well, they're this or that or that, and they've got six offices they're looking after, so they're really busy with this. So then if I'm writing the email, now what's my email going to say? Subject line, is January going to be slow? Question mark. Then inside the email, it's like, hey, I, I understand that you're running about six different doggy daycares. I also understand that in January, you're looking to slow down. I think I might have a way to send you a bunch of dogs in January. Uh, does that sound interesting to you? Send. All right. So I did that all off one phone call. And the monks were just like, what just happened? I said, all right, so let me do it again. All right, so I called up. I was like, all right, who do I want to look up? So I was like, uh, let me do a dance studio. So I called up a dance studio. And it's ringing, and my heart's pounding because you're going to get 20, 20, 16. It seems like 20 people, but it's like 16 or so. It's a long table, all watching these. Ringing, ringing, ringing. And I said, like, okay, guys, again, I'm not really sure what I'm going to say. I have kind of an idea, but my intention is to connect and serve this business in some way. So they pick up, ring, ring. Hello, so and so dance. I said, "Hey, uh, can I speak to a manager?" And they're like, um, "I'm the best person for that." I was like, "Oh, cool, thanks." Um, so this time I pivoted because I wanted them. They well, the, the idea was I was going to cold call businesses. They were going to write down the notes of how I did it, and then they were going to go call the businesses. So uh, I called the lady, and the best you know, the best of my knowledge, I said, "I said, hey, so um, I'm actually a resident monk at a monastery." And we're doing a little research to possibly help dance studios fill all their classes. So I'm just curious if there's any interest or if you, if you have any room for more dancers at your studio. Well, yeah, sure, we've always got room for more dancers. What did you have in mind? Well, we're actually thinking about using Facebook as a tool to drive more dancers to your studio. Can you tell me what your best students are as a demographic? Oh, well, you know, our students are, uh, you know, 45 to 55. They're usually single. They're usually this. They have an income over this. And like, so I'm like, I'm building the Facebook campaign in my head, even though I've never really ran a Facebook campaign. Well, I have ran one, but like, I know generally you have like, I, I don't want, you don't want me running a Facebook campaign. <clears throat> You might want me to, but I would be, it would take a while to learn, right? So I, I got, I'm building the Facebook campaign and I'm like, well, so does this sound like something that you might be interested in trying? And again, she's like, well, you know, I need to really connect you with our owner. I'm not the one to make a decision. And I was like, okay, well, I get, so you get this a lot. So what I do is I say, well, so can you tell me like, if you were the owner, like what's your gut say on this? Would like, would you actually want to do it? They're like, well, yeah, you know, I don't know. We've, We've tried Facebook in the past, or it has, or it hasn't worked, or whatever. Um, it's like, well, cool. Like, you know, can you tell me what what happened? What did you do in the past? And they're like, well, we tried this or this or this. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, I think we'd actually try a different approach. We'd actually be going over here to do this instead. I think it might be worth a shot. There wouldn't be any risk in trying it, but it would really be up to you. Well, again, I'm not the one to make a decision on that. So, um, okay. Well, you know, can you give me the owner's email address or the man owner's email address? Great. They gave me the owner's email address, and I say, all right, uh, so if you could help, help me out, what's the best way that you think I could sell this guy? You know him better than I do, and I'm really interested in you guys having a completely full dance studio. Um, and I can't remember if what she said or if she said anything. And then I, I hung up, and I think that was the last call that I did. But so I hung up, and then the monks got asked questions for a bit. and then. It was actually the next day that uh, five, four, four of the monks had the desire to try and do the cold calling. So we all got in a circle, and this is when the fun started happening. We got in a circle, and I said, all right, we're going to pick yoga studios. Okay, you guys are going to all pick an industry and call it. I was like, what am I All right, how about, how about we actually pick yoga studios, and you guys are each going to take turns calling, watching each other's call. <laughs> they're like <gasps> first guy goes rings goes to voicemail he's like oh thank you all right next guy uh, it's like russian roulette or something. next guy goes and he calls 
and the guy picks up and it was the most awkward conversation uh uh hi uh yeah so this is um can i speak to a manager and they're like uh speaking uh okay, so um uh you, so i we're, i'm a resident here at a monastery here in vermont and we're working on a uh a re this is legitimate pauses, a research to maybe help yoga studios get more students. Um, and I'm wondering if that might be something you're interested in. <laughs> I was totally expecting the person on the end of the phone to be like, what the f is this going on? And but they're, they're, they're like, oh yeah, no, that sounds, um, <laughs> that sounds, uh, what, what are you guys doing again? Well, yeah, I'm a resident and a monk, and we're, we're thinking about putting together a report on how 25 yoga studios fill their classes. Does that sound like something you might be interested in? Yeah, actually, that sounds really good. And then, like, I don't know, the conversation went on for, like, five more minutes. And I can't remember what they said. Hung up the phone. Frickin' victory. The guy made his first call, and it was hilarious. Next guy goes. He calls. Just as awkward and gets a very resonant like initial like wow it sounds really cool i want to talk to you more about it then the third guy goes and this guy is like a natural on the phone i was like watching him i was like i think this guy should teach me teach instead of me like i was like how did you learn this he was just so good you know the lady's like well what are you selling like he, he gets on and the lady's in the middle of a teacher. She's in the middle of a yoga teacher training and she steps out of the yoga teacher training because the approach we use on the cold call is so friendly. Like you don't say your first name. You don't say, hi, my name's Dave Maxwell. I'm calling from. No, you just say, hey, I've got this quick question. We're putting, oh yeah, the, the, the initial opening line is really important. We'd say, I'm, I've got this idea that I'm working on and I wanted to pitch it to you and I wanted to, to know if you thought it was any good. Oh, it works, gangbusters. They're like, oh, sure, yeah, pitch it to me. Like, like they want to be pitched and tell you if it's any good. And she, so she steps out of the yoga teacher training. Like, so we're thinking about putting in this, this report. And she's like, oh, well, I mean, all of our classes are usually full. Oh, well, maybe we might be able to use you for an interview for the report as one of the, one of the top yoga studios. Yeah, and then, and then she's like, well, so who are you again? Well, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a resident and I'm, I'm a, I'm a monastic. They call themselves monastics. I'm like, what are you guys saying that for? Like, I don't think people understand what that means, but they kept saying it and people like seemed to understand what it was. And they're like, I'm a monastic at a monastery and you know, we're just doing research. They're like, well, how did you pick my business? And like, well, we're picking businesses that we think that we do good in the world that we want to support and serve. Like, oh, wow. That's pretty cool. And, uh, you know, and, and then like, they just keep, she keeps talking to the guy and like, she, she ends up saying, you know, like, I don't really think we need that, but, you know, what's really nice is we'd like to get our yoga students coming back more often. You know, we're not really interested in getting students. We want them to come back more often. He's like, well, great. Would you be interested if I put together a report on how top yoga studios are getting their students to come back? And she's like, hmm. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. And then she's like, but I wonder if you could change it. Could you change it to this? Because if you change it to that, then that might warrant an expenditure. And she was like selling herself on how to give the guy money. And so what that conversation What did she want to change to? I can't remember. You know, it was, it, I think, I think, I think he actually ended up pitching her a $50 a month program to interview a yoga studio. And he's like, would you be interested in that? And I was like, don't say that. That's not a good offer. You know, don't say that. And I was like, oh, cringing. And she's like, well, you know, I don't really know. I was like, of course she doesn't know. Cause it's not even any valuable. You're not pitching any value. You're pitching an interview, you know, but like, you know, this is first call. So mm -hmm. I reamed them after the first call. But so Pat and Tech asks, well, what do you say when somebody responds that, no, that's not something I'm interested in. How long do you probe and how long do you just move on? Does the humor help or is it best to just move on? Well, humor is very, very helpful on these calls. If you call with a friendly energy, if you have that like sort of friendly tone in your voice and you really call me say, oh, you're not interested in that, you know, you might just, you, you just judge, you know, every call is different. Not a single rejection happened uh, on the seven calls. Then it got back to the guy that went to voicemail. He called another one. And then it went to voicemail again. It's like, you're not getting off the hook. You call. Mm -hmm. And so like, he kept calling until someone picked up. And he ended up talking to a guy for like 10 minutes. 
And that guy didn't want to didn't want a guy. Like it went really well. So I got this guy. I got this thing. I want to pitch you, and I want you to tell me if it's any good or not. So he pitched him the report on how to fill the yoga classes, and uh, the guy's like, "No, you know, I'm not really interested in that." But they were what they were interested in. They had this terrible problem with staffing. You know, they use the, They like what happens is the yoga studios use their use their their students to staff the staff the locations, but it proves to be really unreliable. It becomes a giant nightmare for the owner. That's a serious, serious, real pain, much, much, much greater than the other two pains. So what happens is at the end of the, the calling, we have these three guides, a guide on how to get yoga students in your classes, how to keep them coming back as another guide, and a third guide on how to effectively staff your yoga practice. And in one hour, they had a full-fledged model to build out and sell the yoga studios that the yoga studios had all expressed interest in. Within an hour, they had an entire business blueprint. And all they had to do was go interview other yoga studios on how to fill this information. And in the yoga studios they interview, they then give them the product free for their participation. Everybody wins. You're now creating a business from scratch. You have no excuse to be poor anymore. So what happens is the, the monks, like they were just flipping out. They're like, wow, they did not have any idea that it could be really this easy. So if someone says I'm not interested, I would probably smile and be like, well, is there anything you're interested in? You know, like, I'm just, you know, it's, it's a conversation with another human being that has a heart, that has fears, that has desires, that has pains, that if you give up, you may give up the chance to serve. Um, you know, if someone says, no, I'm not interested in that, I would, I would probably then say, it's like, wow, that's pretty exciting. You see, so you sound like you have a pretty busy business. Yeah, we got a pretty busy business. Well, like, that's pretty awesome. I wonder if you would ever be open to an interview where I could actually interview on everything you're doing really well to share with other businesses so they might be successful as well. You know, and then they might be oh, well, like, no, like, remember your intention is to serve. You're an instrument for good. You're an instrument for service. You're an instrument for peace. You're an instrument for profit for everyone that's involved. And when you go in, you go into a business with this kind of freedom, yes to that. I think on Wednesday, would you be game to doing this live on our call? Yeah, I mean, Wednesday? yeah, it's 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 always it's always a treat to do for people. You know, I I feel I feel a little fear initially, but that's natural. Like, let's let's do it. Cool. It'd be Wednesday at this time. Yep. We gotta find an industry we could call at this time. That's no problem. We'll try and find something. Just seven mountain. <laughs> So you'll have 6 p.m. West Coast, 9 p.m. East Coast, West Coast Yoga Studios. Something's got to be open till 10 p.m. We shall find it. Okay. <laughs> so if you're listening, if you're listening, make sure that you come back on Wednesday night at uh, 7 p.m. Mountain Time. Now the catch on Wednesday is that we're going to be doing it a little bit different. Wednesday's uh, Hangout is going to be only for foundation applicants. Uh, so if you're interested in listening to Dane Cohen call, watching it actually happen, make sure that you click the Apply button uh, on the foundation page and apply to join us for the last class that we have coming up. Uh, well, last class that Dane will be teaching coming up. And, uh, and then we'll send you details on how to join us for that webinar, because that'll be a really fun one if we do all this live. Oh, dang it, Andy, you got me cold calling people, huh? Mm -hmm. It's easy to do for monks. You know, I had, a, I had a girl come to me once, and she's like, Dane, what should I do for my business? I've got this business plan. What books do I need to read? And da 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 And I started giving all this advice, and before long, I was like, you know what? Screw all this. Can I just get you your first customer? And she's like, sure. Have I told you this? Mm -hmm. So okay. you can say it again for people listening. Okay. So, yeah. Andy, Andy's heard all my stuff more than once. <laughs> God bless you, Andy, and your patience. You must be practicing mindfulness. So, like, I call, I call, uh, I was like, she, she's a naturopathic doctor, and she's got, she's like, wants to give people B12 shots where she sticks them in the butt, puts the B12 in them, and they feel awesome. And she wants to do it as a corporate wellness for companies. And I said, okay, well, okay. So let me, let me just get you for like, I was like trying to teach her. So like, let me just get your first customer. So we call up a car, like, I'm like, all right, let's do deal car dealerships. Let me call one that's close by you so you can drive to it and give them B12 shots. Excuse me. So I call, up, I call up the car dealership. I'm like, hey, can I talk to the manager? They're like, uh, who's calling? And he's like, oh, this is Dane. I'm calling about a car. <laughs> they passed me to the car salesman. 
the car, the car manager. And you can bend the truth at your discretion. I, you know, I feel my heart wince a little bit when I, when I do it, but I was just like wanting to get this over with pretty quick. So they, they get the manager on the phone and I said, Hey, uh, I got a quick question for you. I've got this idea. I want to pitch you and I just want you to tell me if it's any good or not. I was like, sure, go ahead. So how would you feel about giving uh, your car salesman B12 shots to improve their focus, clarity, and, uh, and, and energy so they sell more cars? He's like, uh, no. <laughs> no, I'm not interested. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, we just drink Red Bull. We just drink a lot of Red Bull. So, oh. So I just stay silent for like 30 seconds. I don't say a word. And he's like typing. And I was like, I don't know what the frick to say to this guy. How in the world do I navigate this? Red Bull's terrible for you. This ain't going to work very well. Well, okay, I'll just sit on the phone. He's like, well, how much is it? <laughs> Maybe I'll give it a shot. And I was like, well, how, how much is it? I was like, we'll do it at co cost for you. He's like, well, how much? I'm like, oh, it's like 25 bucks. It's like 25 bucks. And I wish I would have said like 75. Like she said 25, I could have tripled the price. Like if I would have been, been on my game a little more, I would have said 75. I was like 20, it's like 25 bucks? Hmm. Well, maybe I'll just have all my salesmen do it. <laughs> okay, well, can we come in tomorrow? And he's like, sure. He's like, well, how does nine o'clock sound? He's like, well, yeah, nine o'clock's free for us. I'm like, great, I'll have one of our associates over to you at nine o'clock. You know, and then I hang up the phone. Oh, no, and then he goes, he's like, and at the end of the call, he's like, man, this is going to be great. We don't have to drink Red Bull anymore. That stuff's terrible for you. <laughs> Did she do it? Yeah, she went the next day, and she made the money. And, I, you know, that's a that's a $1,000 a month contract, you know, that she's, she's like, doing, like, I don't know how many does she, you know, $250. If she does 10 car salesmen a week, $1,000 a month from one phone call. You guys want to make a thousand dollars a month from one phone call? I tell you, the world really opens up to you when you just start talking to these businesses. It can be pretty exciting. So we have six Clint minutes. Says, Clint says, "Yeah, we'll, we'll answer this question, and then we'll wrap uh, and talk a little bit about the last class." I'm a forester from Wisconsin. I built an email list and phone numbers of farmers, loggers, and environmental companies, etc. Many of the people I call are not tech savvy at all, making software difficult. How do I overcome this, or should I find a new target audience for cold calling? Well, one of the criteria for your market is that they currently pay for software of some kind. So if your market's not really paying for any software right now, that means they're probably not using software. They'd probably pick a new market. Disagree, but <laughs> my, yeah. here's, here's why I disagree. Um, my, my family are farmers. Like my dad's a construction worker, um, and they do pay for software, and they pay a shitload of money for software. They're paying like, 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 50 grand for a GPS system that goes on <laughs> bulldozers and stuff. They pay a lot of money for software. Um, and there's hardly anybody creating stuff for them. Uh, you know, when I, when mm. I, my dad has there, the company has like 200 pieces of equipment and each piece of equipment has to be tracked for oil changes, maintenance reports, all of the numbers have to be written off the hours for each one has to be logged all year long. And then they do these reports at the end of the year to see uh, if they got an ROI in the machines or not. And they do all of it by hand because there's nothing out there for it. Um, so we're actually on the same page here. I, I highly say, recommend it. Yeah. We're, we're on the same page. Cause I said, if the uh, criteria is that they currently pay for software. And so you said they do pay for software. It's like, well, then you want, you probably want to do it, but do you want to, be the first in the market with a software product for your first software business. Say, you know, the, there's some nuance to it, but if, if they're not buying, if they have no history of ever buying software, I would probably try to sell them something else. So, but yeah, Andy and I actually, I think it's nice to know, like we actually didn't sharing the same sentiment. Totally. So Is there any, other, any other questions? Um, Money is personal. This is an awesome event. I love the authenticity, authenticity in the host, Dan and Andy, and speakers. Clint, you could target the office admin staff. They're close, who have the knowledge and are closest to the pain. True story. Um, and then that's it. So, guys, if you're interested, if you're enjoying this, if you're getting a lot out of the summit, uh, apply to the foundation. We're teaching, Dan will be teaching the last class that he's going to be involved with this is hands down going to be the best class that we've ever taught. And 
That isn't some marketing talk. It, it literally is. We're giving you more access to, uh, access to us than we've ever given before. And we're bringing in Andrew Warner from Mixergy and a couple other mentors to help teach as well. Um, so if you're looking to immerse yourself in learning the skill of making money, of acquiring customers, of, of starting a business, uh, this is this is a, I don't want to say a once in a lifetime sh opportunity, but it's a pretty rare opportunity to get this much attention uh, for you over the course of the next six months. Do you have anything you'd like to add, Dan? I think one of the one of the top and the list of the top decisions of of my life were buying programs like this. You know, it's opposite of my life, you know. I've spent thousands and thousands of dollars on programs similar to the foundation. Thousands and thousands of dollars on seminars. I was the first I was first in line to buy the hundred dollar ebooks that would promise this or that. I, I I bought and devoured everything I could get my hands on while the skeptics would be like, Oh, I'm not gonna buy this. I was just diving into everything. And now I have a great life. You know, I, I, I loved interviewing Chandler. If you guys you'll watch Chandler's interview on, on Wednesday. Um, he was 19 when he joined the foundation foundations, five grand. Uh, he was 19 years old. He spent five grand. All of his friends and family told him he was crazy. Um, three, th no, he's, what is he? Is he 22 now? I can't remember. He's 22 or 23. 23. Three, three years later, he's running his, his business is on track to do over $2 million this year. And now all of his friends and family are asking him, wait, what did you do? How did you do this? asking him all of the questions around it so yeah foundation's a life changer if if you want to do it we've got many stories like chandler well not actually one story of one 19 year old you know chandler's a hard worker you know he wrote me handwritten thank you notes that i got in the mail and he actually came to live with me after the foundation far after the foundation and uh we we had a we had a, a call once where he was thinking about dropping out of college and i was part of that conversation with him to help him drop out of college. That, that was a pivotal decision that he made. So Chandler made a lot of really great decisions. The first of which was not the first of well, the, the, the one that really catalyzed everything was to join the foundation. And he spent six months building a software business. And now he owns another company that's helping people publish books. But all the skills he learned to build software, he's now using those skills to start another company, which is why it's really, really stressed that I think people should try entrepreneurship for six months, learn these skills, and then go be potent in the world with whatever you want to do. Clint says, what kind of time commitment should does someone only a business minor expect for the SaaS learning process? Um, I've listened to all your podcasts and done a bit of research. As much as you can. You know, uh, you know ideally, you enjoy it. So time is like, you're like, oh, you don't have to. You know, but as much as you can, it depends. Um, if you have less than an hour a day, you'll probably be stressed. Mm -hmm. If you have if you have two hours a day, you can really do it pretty well. And the more time, the better. But it's hopefully you know you're you're not looking at it. You're not looking at this thing where you're gonna do all this work and then just get this payoff and oh, and then relax. And hopefully it's like every day you're really enjoying the process of it and you're present to it and you're not adding thoughts. You know, like imagine if I if I told you guys to go do a cold call right now, how many thoughts would you start adding? Don't add any of those thoughts. Pick up the phone and dial. So yeah. So yeah. With that, guys, it is eight oh one. Thank you all for showing up. Tomorrow we're gonna get started uh, just before nine o'clock. Tomorrow's lineup is absolutely ridiculous, guys. We've got Ash from Lean Stack, Peldy from Balsamic which is a fascinating interview. Um, they're at 7 million in revenue. Nathan Berry, who just grew from ConvertKit from 10 grand a month to 400 grand a month. Brian Moran from Samcart, uh, who launched his business, his SaaS business doing 40 grand a month. Rob Whaling, Whaling who just sold um, Drip to lead pages for a life-changing sum of money. Laura from Meet Edgar, who uh, built her software business and within a year was at seven figures in revenue while she uh, had her first child at the same time. Stu from Wishlist, Nathan Latka from Heyo, and guys, if you haven't been following Nathan, he's he's doing one of the most innovative processes I've seen for people to acquire businesses really quickly. And I got him to open up and share step-by-step step how he does it. And it is phenomenal. So um, all of that. And then tomorrow night, same time tomorrow night, it's going to be me, Dane, and Andrew Warner hanging out. Um, join us there. We're going to be chilling, talking with Andrew about lessons he's learned from interviewing so many entrepreneurs over the course of the years. Um, 
So with that, thank you guys for showing up and we'll be seeing you bright and early in the morning tomorrow. Anything, Dane? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Later, guys.